So, um, so the problem with publishing books, if you have done it or want to try it, is that once you're done, you get to find out all the ways in which you were wrong or didn't predict things strongly enough. So this talk is, in a way, an attempt of mine to address this. Um, Part of this comes from the premise that uh, big data can actually create social control, that by its very nature, the way that it's built, a side effect often is social control. And there's a few ways in which I see this manifesting. Uh, the first of this, uh, these we talked about a little bit already, is that algorithms in many cases have their own bias. We do really like to think of big data and analytics as being neutral. It's science, right? It helps us discover the truth. But unfortunately, big data comes from models that human beings put together, and human beings have biases. And then once they put those in place, we get a lot of data that runs through them so that, that then either reinforces those biases or um, reinforces other effects of those biases. And the result is that we get truth that is biased. Now, this has some effects. So for example, uh, in a number of elections, it's been shown that Google results can swing, swing the elections by a significant margin. This happens when you have undecided voters who go to Google to figure out what to do. And it turns out that they uh, are strongly affected by the search engine ranking that they get. Now, anyone who's ever done any marketing online knows this, right? That's why SEO exists, is that the higher your search engine results, the more people will trust it. But of course, the search engines have their own biases. And the kind of results that they give you then swing the way that people end up voting. Now, you may have already guessed this, but it turns out that there are more people using the internet to research things than less. So this trend is perhaps <laughs> going to be exacerbated. Um, the next thing is that big data can personalize everything. Uh, this I talked a little bit in my last book, but it turns out that it's coming true in lots of ways that I hadn't necessarily expected. So by way of example, almost six or seven years ago now, Microsoft, of all people, which tells you that um, everybody else is already doing this, it released two patents, the first of which allowed them to assign a score to anybody's ability to influence people about a word or topic. So for example, you might have an awesome blog about cheese. You talk all about cheese. Everyone loves your opinion about cheese. So you have a super high score. You're 700 for cheese. On the other hand, you only ever tweeted once about cheese, and it's because you're lactose intolerant. No one wants to hear your opinion on cheese. You're seven. You both go online to buy some cheese. And the second patent comes into play, which allows them to dynamically price goods or services based on that score. So you get a 500% price deduction, because if you do buy that cheese and say something good about it, it more than amortizes the marketing costs for the producer. You, on the other hand, cheese disaster, triple the price, quadruple the price, whatever it takes. We don't want you having our cheese, right? Well, this has been borne out. And a number of tests have shown that companies like Amazon are now doing tests where they're changing pricing based on area code, zip code, age, gender, um, web pages you've gone to previously, things that other people you know or are friended on Facebook have said about those products. You can imagine the implications. The third big thing that struck me, and this is really what was the genesis for this talk, came last summer when I did a TV series in China for Discovery Channel. And I uh, ended up um, with some time on my hands while I was there talking with some, some locals about the concept of social software and how I felt we ought to be able to control our social data in a way that allowed us to monetize it according to our needs or desires. And someone came up to me and said, hey, this is totally cool. I get what you're talking about. We've already got it. We're way ahead of you. It's called um, Sesame Credit. And the way that it works is Tencent, which is uh, they run the biggest social software platform in China, partner with the government, who of course controls all the banks. And they combine all your financial transactions and all your financial history and everything that you do online and put it together. And you get a social score or a credit score that you can actually use. Now, this is great if you don't have a lot of financial history, for example. You really need a loan. You don't have a lot of financial history. It shows that you're a really good citizen based on everything that you do socially online. Good. Cool. Love that. Um, however, it has a few other side effects. And it turns out that this is actually a valuable thing. Uh, the credit score that it gives you can be used to influence your ability to get a, a business loan, for example, or to get a travel visa, stuff that actually really does matter. What's interesting about it is that it also shows you what your friend's credit scores are. And your friend's credit scores obviously directly influence your credit score. So if you have a friend who has a really low credit score, you know, you can hit one button and you don't have to listen to them anymore. You don't have to hear those people. Now, not surprisingly, but perhaps distressingly, the number one way to lower your credit score is to criticize the government. So maybe that's bad. <laughs> For us, we probably think that's bad. So 
So I spent a long time thinking, China, you know, we're not going to do that over here. Uh, and then five days ago, I found out that in the UK, Home Office has now got a new edict where they are unifying all the records that the entire government, every government branch has on every one of their citizens. Everything from your tax records to your traffic tickets is going to be put in one single unified searchable database. Will they do this? I don't know. Could they? Yes. Do human beings have a really good history of doing what we can just because we can? Yes. So maybe we should be worried. Now, all of that's kind of interesting, and, we, and we've talked, you know, the other speakers particularly have got some really good examples of how pernicious and, and horrible some of these effects can be. I think that we ought to look, step back for a minute and look at, at exactly how horrifying this could be in terms of scale. There's a few things happening that make me think that these isolated examples, uh, isolated examples might become less so uh, very soon. And the first of those is the data that's being collected right now is in fact getting bigger. Um, by way of scale, in the last two years, we've collected almost as much data as in the entirety of human history leading up to that. And that, that hockey stick is, is going up, right? Um, that data is mostly being collected by private organizations. We've already done our Google bashing, but just to get one more in, 80% uh, of all of the top million websites have Google tracking code on it, um, so they're basically everywhere. Uh, but just as a, an alternative statistic, the growth of social software is continuing to rise um, as much as they are worried about how the U.S. is basically fully covered. There are, in fact, other markets, uh, and they are going there, which leads me to the next problem, which is that the people that are being enrolled in these systems are increasingly the ones without alternatives. Um, in other words, if you have no social platforms and you're given one, you are more likely to try and do something useful with that one than stand back and say, well, I don't know. And then uh, lastly, most people don't have any understanding of the scope of this stuff. Now, my background's in IT, specifically IT security. So I, this always kind of gives me heebie-jeebies. I wake up in the middle of the night kind of panting about this stuff, which distresses my wife. But, um, but as an example, it turns out in the US, just to give you an example, and, and we should know, right? We've had these software packages more, longer than almost anybody. Uh, only 14% of people understand that their web surfing history is being tracked. Now, for me, that's a little bit like discovering that 86% of the United States population still believe in the Easter Bunny. It's a little terrifying because it means that the conversations we're having here today put us all in an extraordinarily elite group in understanding the potential damages. Most people just don't know. They want to share their pictures of cats, and that's enough. So is there a silver lining to all this? Well, yes, sort of. Um, people are starting to notice, right? Uh, Apple and the FBI had a big tussle, and everyone started saying, well, hey, you know, maybe privacy is important. I don't know. There's maybe something we should talk about. Um, Ashley Madison, for those of you who don't know, a website that facilitates, facilitates extramarital affairs. Um, uh, they got hacked, uh, which disturbed a lot of people because they thought that you know, Ashley Madison had told them that they wouldn't let anyone get that information. Uh, the Panama Papers, which did more towards promoting encryption with the 1% than anything in the last 40 years, right? <laughs> so, so there's some good things that have come out of this. The question now is, is what do we do from here? And, um, and the answer, I think, is that we do what we are doing here now. We talk to each other. We try and figure out how to get other people to talk about it. And we try and get society at large to recognize that this is a critical issue. Now, there's, I think, a, r a really critical timeline on all of this. Right now, only about one third of the planet is online. So that's us and a few other people. The remaining two thirds, however, are coming online in the next five to 15 years, which is an, an incredibly short period of time. And what that means is that our ability to change this narrative, to change what the norm is for these packages, for these social software packages, the platforms, the tools, our chance to change the dialogue is in the next five years. It's not in the next 30. So we should get on it. And more importantly, we should get on it now. So that's it. Thanks very much. <laughs>